So to start off, I just want to say that history is, is dangerous. In fact, it's the most dangerous field of study that we have. Not for the people within it, of course. Historians are, oops, there we go. Historians are quite safe as they plunder libraries and archives throughout the world. But the outcome of their work, what we call history, is dangerous. It's so dangerous, in fact, that it's often used as a weapon. And I would argue that it is among the most dangerous weapons humanity's ever conceived. I didn't always hold history in such high regard. In fact, when I was younger, I didn't really care about it at all. I was a science kid, I was a science student, and I thought anything that didn't have numbers in it was trivial. History, there was no certainty in it, so I didn't see the value. So when I went into school, went to university, I studied science. My father had studied science, my brothers studied science, so I didn't really think about it. I just went into, went into the sciences, and I enrolled in chemical engineering. And when I was in chemical engineering, I thought I was walking down this path of scientific superiority. Uh, I was arrogant, and I, was con I would condescend to anyone who, who couldn't solve uh, vector calculus problems. But then, lo and behold, I couldn't solve vector calculus problems. So I had to rethink things. And as I was sifting through the shards of my shattered dreams of being an engineer, I started to reflect on my own past. And I realized that I didn't really like history, but I felt compelled to take it Sorry, I didn't like science, but I felt compelled to take it because that was what my family history had led me to believe was what was natural. And as I was thinking about my past, I started to think about the parts of science that I did enjoy. In particular, atomic theory, our perception of the atom. And even more particularly was how it has changed over time, from the simple billiard ball model of John Dalton to the cinnamon bun model to the uh, Bohr-Rutherford model and then finally the atomic orbital model we have today. This progression is what interested me, and I realized that it wasn't actually chemistry that I liked, but it was the history of chemistry. And so I enrolled in, in history. And as Spanish philosopher George Santayana said, those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. So what is history? Well, there are a lot of misconceptions, so I think the first thing to do is uh, establish what it isn't. And history is not just a bunch of dates and names and events arranged in chronological order. It's a lot more than knowing that D-Day took place on June 6, 1944, or the storming of the Bastille was on July 14, 1789, or that Johannes Gutenberg perfected his, <coughs> perfected his printing press in 1450. Knowing when these things took place is important, but it's just the beginning. Historians are more concerned about extracting meaning out of these events. Why did D-Day change the way the world was after World War II? Why did the French people revolt against their king? How was education changed by the printing press? These are the things that historians are concerned with. So almost uh, 2,600 years ago, back to the very beginning of history, uh, a Greek man named Herodotus set out to, in his own words, preserve the memory by putting on record the amazing accomplishments of both the Greeks and the barbarians and to show how they came into conflict. So in doing so, he created the academic discipline of history as we know it today. At least the foundations of it. And for that, I'll be forever thankful. Unfortunately, this is still how many people perceive history. History isn't just uh, reporting on the past. Um, people perceive the historian as being an objective witness. That's not the case. It's not their goal either. Put quite simply, history is the study of everything that has happened. So some people study ideas, some study culture, some study race, some study class, gender. Uh, the list goes on. But not only do they study these things, uh, they actually make arguments about these things. And that is really what history is about. It's, you're never going to know exactly what happened. But what you can do is make an argument about what has happened. So you use the, the limited data that we have. Obviously, the past is full of qualitative data. But we only have access to, to a fraction of it. So you use this to make an argument. And this is where creativity comes into history. Uh, when we think creativity, we think new, we think original, we think progress. We don't think to look backwards, but that's exactly what historians do. They look back in time and use creativity to come up with new and original uh, perceptions of the past. So this actually leads to diversity in history. And diversity in history is a good thing. Uh, the way one person sees something is different than how you see it or you see it, and everyone will have a different version of the past. And as more people participate in a particular field of history, 
the more uh, interpretations you get, and you end up with a more comprehensive or holistic interpretation of the past. So no historian writes the history, they only write a history. And uh, maybe I'll, I'll try and, uh, try and uh, show you how it's done here. Um, so I actually uh, grew up on a farm from a fall, small farming town. Uh, my dad was a farmer, my grandpa was a farmer, and uh, as, as a child, my parents would, would tell me stories, and without realizing it, I was getting you know, farming history. And one story was my particular favorite. Um, there was two farmers, not that long ago, there lived two farmers, and one had a, a chicken, and the other one had a cow. So the chicken farmer worked really hard. He took great care of his chicken, and the hen rewarded him every day with, with beautiful eggs. And then the cow farmer, well, he was a bit different, he was lazy. He didn't work very hard. And over time, his cow gets sick, she stops producing milk, and he gets rid of the cow. So now he's lost his source of income, so he's becoming desperate, he's getting hungry, and he's looking towards his neighbor with great jealousy, because he's doing so well with his hen. So the cow farmer decides he's going to steal. He's going to steal the hen. So he waits until the moment is right, he climbs into his neighbor's house, and steals the hen. Now, he real, uh, the farmer with the hen realizes what's going on, he catches him, and a big fight ensues. And unfortunately, the, uh, the chicken farmer is murdered by his neighbor. So has anyone heard this story before? Anyone? Show of hands? No one? Okay. Well, you've probably all heard it, because it's actually the story of Jack and the Beanstalk. Now, when you heard it, it might have been a little different. You might have heard about uh, some magic beans, uh, some golden eggs, and maybe a, a terrible giant. But you can see how stressing uh, different uh, aspects of what happened gives you a completely different story. Well, this is what happens in history. And for this reason, we get those multiple histories. And, and this is good. Uh, but why does it matter to you? Well, it matters because history is collective memory. It's how our society mem remembers things. So as a result, it has an impact on the present. Karl Marx said that men make their own history. This is true. But he also said they don't make it as they please. And forgive his gendered language. He was born over 200 years ago. Uh, they don't make it as they please. They do so under pre-selected circumstances that were given and transmitted from the past. So in other words, the generations before us have defined much of what your life is going to be like before you are even born. So, in that way, history impacts everyone. Whether it's because you studied chemical engineering because that's what your family does, or when two nations go to war with each other to rectify past injustices. Now I mentioned that history is a weapon at the start of this talk. And it is a weapon. It's weaponized when it's used to convince people to perform violent actions. People aren't born angry. They have to learn how to hate. And unfortunately, history is a good teacher. The most staggering instances of this are the, gener the genocides of the 20th century. The, uh, the genocides against the Armenians and the Ottoman Empire, against the Kulaks and the Soviet Union, the Jews and other minority groups in Nazi Germany, and the Cambodians by the Khmer Rouge. Combined, these genocides account for the deaths of over 30 million people, almost the population of Canada, erased. Now there's a lot of similarities between these two, or these, these different genocides, but the most shocking one is how the leaders used history. In all instances, the country had sort of fallen on hard times, and the, the leaders used this mythic past. They created this illusion of a time when the country was, was better off. And the desperate people of these countries believed this past, despite the fact that it was inaccurate, it was treacherous, uh, it was serving a purpose, but the people still bought into it. And then they were forced, or they were, they were willing to act upon it. And what you, what you see is the result of that. So history is indeed a weapon, and these unfortunate uh, deaths stand as uh, stark evidence of that. But I believe that history can also be used as a shield. When we think creatively about the past, we can see all the different sides. So this critical thinking is essential, and it's something that history teaches us. When we look at both sides of a problem, we can see where people are coming from, why things are the way they are, and we can begin to challenge them. We can use history as a shield. Every uh, conflict has historical roots, whether it's a conflict between nations, social classes, or religions. And the only way we can overcome these conflicts is by discovering and understanding these roots. And once we understand them, we can challenge them. 
So I'll give an example now, uh, not as fun as my Jack and the Beanstalk one, of when history has been used as a shield. On March 6, 1968, during the Vietnam War, a U.S. Army unit was sent to attack this village that had been reported to be an enemy stronghold. These soldiers, before arriving there, had been told that there was a long history of hatred between the Vietnamese and American people. They perceived communism to be a direct threat to their livelihood. And so when they got there, they, were, uh, they weren't perceiving the Vietnamese to be human beings, but something less. And that's what history did to their minds before they got there. When they arrived, they actually didn't find the enemies they thought they were going to find. They found a village of innocent women, children, and elderly Vietnamese people. However, they continued to carry out their orders anyway. Now, all the soldiers there uh, participated, but some of them actually challenged the orders. A group, of, uh, a group in a helicopter hovering overhead saw what was going on and immediately tried to intervene. The pilot, Hugh Thompson, landed his helicopter, immediately rushed to the commanding officer and asked, what's going on? The officer turned to him and said, we're just following orders. Now these words should be familiar to you. Uh, they're used frequently to defend um, war criminals. Most famously, the, the Nazis after the Second World War. Just following orders. Very powerful words. Now, Hugh Thompson and his crew, they weren't deceived by these, these words. They looked past it. They thought critically. They, weren't allowed, they didn't allow themselves to be deceived by history. And they did their best to try and intervene. Unfortunately, it was too little too late. By the end of the day, over 500 innocent Vietnamese lay dead. However, they were able to save 14 people. And one of them was uh, an infant that had been shot and left to die in a drainage ditch. One of the soldiers crawled into the ditch, pulled the infant out, they flew him to a hospital and the infant survived. And that's, that's what using history as a shield can do. You can have a positive impact. One person using history as a shield is great. It will change the way you look at the world. But working together, we can do more. The Greeks, the people who came up with the, the concept of history as an academic study, also had a military concept called the phalanx. Essentially, they interlocked their shields to create an impenetrable barrier. Now, we can do the same thing with our historical shields. We can interlock our shields and work to make a better world. And this barrier will hopefully protect us from repeating the, the mistakes of past generations. So, in, in summation, the next time history is used to compel you to action, I ask that you think critically about the past. Look at the situation from both sides. Don't allow history to be a weapon. Don't look for problems in the past. Look for solutions. So the last uh, thing I just want to say is let's interlock our shields and work together to make a better future. Thank you.